didn't expect that, did you? Neither did I. Liking this, I mean. So far, whenever people have asked me what I think about 18th and 19th century military sabers, my response has basically been, meh, not really my thing. Why is that? Well, you can't really quantify personal taste and justify and explain it, but there's more to it than that. I have not given these sabers the credit they deserve, I suppose, and a big part of that is, well, quite frankly, shoddy reproductions. I've reviewed some bad ones that I don't have anymore for obvious reasons, and uh, even this Killage, which I reviewed recently, which I had a positive opinion of, because in this price range, it's really quite good. But um, there's something missing. Then there is my practice Hungarian saber, which I like. It's well made overall. And it seems pretty light, you know, as you dry handle it, seems quite good. But then in Hema practice, when I use this saber and my training partner used a mortuary hilt or a light basket hilt or even a side sword, I felt I was at a severe disadvantage because you will definitely feel it eventually. It may not be a big deal at first versus like, okay, yeah, this is fine. But then when you encounter just how much quicker the opponent is and you're like, oh crap, you have, trouble keeping up. And then you look at the blade and you're like, hmm, that ain't much of a distal taper. It has one. Might be difficult to see on camera because it's pretty subtle. It does thin toward the tip, but for most of it, it's pretty consistently the same thickness and it tapers a little bit. Now check this out in comparison. Doesn't matter what camera angle it is, you'll definitely see this, right? That's a substantial distal taper. It starts out pretty thick and then it thins out to a mere two millimeters. And that is accurate. You know, this is a reproduction of a 1796 light cavalry saber. Some of those are as thick as 10 millimeters down here and thin to two or two and a half. Now, fortunately, this is the first time ever that I've encountered historically accurate reproductions of these types of saber. Who did that? LK Chen. They now make uh, European swords, as well, and, well, American in this case, in addition to the Chinese ones, and they give them the same sort of diligent treatment, research, and focus on accuracy. And it shows. And now suddenly my meh response changed to a wow response. Technical terms. I'm a professional. <laughs> no, I'm not. Of all the 18th, 19th, and 20th century sabers, I've always liked this one the most, simply because of the blade shape. Um, it's much wider than most of them and pretty strongly curved. So far, what's put me off reproductions of that era is not just aesthetics, but also just how poorly made they are, most of them. Because a distal taper in a certain price range and in general on the reproduction market, you pretty much don't see. By the way, I'm not trying to go back to my old uh, fallacy of every sword needs a distal taper, otherwise it's garbage. There are some that don't need it, didn't have it, could get away without it or however you want to put it. And sometimes you want a less pronounced distal taper perhaps, because really what this is about is power versus maneuverability. Do you, do you want to hit hard or do you want to hit fast? This one had a distal taper historically and it was pretty important because this is a hefty blade. I mean, just look at the sucker, right? If you just see it from the side, it's quite hefty looking. You can take the average thickness, so you know, add the thickest and the thinnest, divide it by two and just make the entire thing the same thickness, but it's just not going to feel like this. It, this makes it way more lively. It also has other advantages, like for example, you have more mass here. This is your defense. You block and parry 
here. More mass means it's harder to force it out of the way. Of course, it being the fort or the strong of the blade, it's harder to break through anyway, but additional mass here helps. Also with all the, the impact shock here, it just can, it can resist better. This is a cavalry saber. Of course, there's different dynamics than fighting on foot, but you can easily fight on foot with this. Either way, even if you are on horseback, an argument can be made that it doesn't need to be as nimble because you're just gonna you know, swing it and the speed of the horse adds to the speed of your swing. So you don't even have to swing that hard. You can just, you know, go like this and decimate infantry soldiers. But you're also going to be fighting other cavalry. So if both of you are on horseback, assuming that you don't just charge past each other and then try to hit each other, in which case it's still important how agile it is. But particularly if both horses are at standstill or are moving slowly, now you need to be able to actually fence. One way or another, whether you are on horseback or on foot, the ability to parry and repost quickly is, well, a lifesaver in historical combat. The thing is, this killage here weighs less. This weighs about 300-ish grams, I think, less than that. They're both under a kilo, by the way. And yes, I can, I can do it, but it takes quite a bit more energy. This, on the other hand, doesn't strain my forearm anywhere near as much, and I can generate some pretty good tip speed. You know, if you follow through all the way, you can hear it. Of course, with a heftier object, you can make it easier on yourself by allowing it to follow through and use the momentum. So if I take the scabbard, which obviously is not tapered and is pretty forward heavy, I can do this. But guess what happens if you and I are fighting and you see this big shoulder powered cut coming and you step back or otherwise evaded, there's an opening, as opposed to this. Gives you much less time to respond. So this relies more on tightening the bottom finger. So the, the index finger and thumb holds onto it fairly firmly. The other fingers are loose until you uncoil, snap forward and tighten those. Is this as powerful a cut? Of course not. It's way weaker than this, right? But, if you want to survive, this doesn't expose you anywhere near as much. Again, fully aware, I'm applying infantry combat logic to cavalry sabers, but some of it still applies. Like I said, when cavalry fights other cavalry, that can very well be relevant. And even if you fight with infantry at a standstill or a slow speed without rushing past them, it's still useful to, you know, throw a cut that doesn't expose you as much as this big thing where you follow through around the world and have a defensive break, if you will. Also, a strong distal taper like this facilitates thrusts. And you can very well thrust with a saber like this. In fact, even with this 1796, you can. It may not look like it because it's so, so strongly curved, so you're not gonna do this, but what you can very well do is lunge like that. So I'm driving in, in a curve to achieve the same kind of effect. With this one, it's even easier. I can pretty much perform a rapier lunge just by twisting my fingers and it'll, it'll work. And that's quite useful because the further you move the mass back, the more temp control you have. So you can do things like disengage and thrust. The other thing that really bothers me about most reproductions of sabers from that era is they're dull as a butter knife quite often. And these, these might be too sharp. You can argue that complaints about lack of sharpness are historically accurate. There are some sources where uh, soldiers complain about cuts being ineffective against sturdy clothing because they just weren't sharp enough. But that just depends on the particular time frame, the particular type of saber, you know, whatever 
military regulations were in effect at the time. Hopefully I'll get around to testing these LKHN reproductions soon. Currently not an option because... But my prognosis for these is they're going to be scary. So this kind of thing really makes me appreciate why so many people who are not obsessive nerds have so little clue about historical swords. Because even if you, you've handled and test cut with etc. a number of reproductions, that might still leave you clueless depending on their quality. If they're not particularly accurate, there's not a whole lot you can learn from that. And you know, most people haven't even handled any reproduction or practice historical martial arts. So yeah, of course you get stereotypes like, these swords are so heavy and they, don't, they didn't cut and blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, you can't even really blame people. Or can I? Anyway, sorry if this is not the most coherent and concise video ever, but this is something that I really felt like talking about, ranting about, whatever you want to call it. Just, um, these have been a bit of an eye-opener. And I'm not quite as biased against this type of saber anymore. I still think that Renaissance swords are superior, both functionally and aesthetically, but I have not given these enough credit and I'm appreciating them more now that I have proper reproductions. Oh, by the way, this is take two because I wasn't quite satisfied with the lighting and background in the first one, but I'm going to put the first take up anyway as bonus content for Patreon supporters and YouTube members like, because I have a slightly different approach. I formulate things a little bit differently. And even though I figured it wasn't quite good enough for the cruel mistress that is the YouTube algorithm, um, it wasn't bad. And uh, instead of deleting it, I might as well put it up as extra content. Either way, hope you found this entertaining, interesting, what have you. Thanks for watching and have a good one, folks.